is a custom at our church that I ask you to share with me tonight. If you know the words, please say them. He is risen. He is risen Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray to our risen Savior. King Jesus, we come to you tonight, and we come to you as small outposts of heaven that have gathered together here as your people. We pray, Lord, that there will be a day that you will sing over every person here in heaven. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would descend among us tonight. And Lord, the miracle that we asked for this evening, the miracle that we have prayed for, is that lives would be changed and that souls would be saved. We pray, Spirit, that you would please come among us, that you would open up our hearts to hear and understand your word. We pray that you would enliven our imagination so that we might go to a garden tonight and there in our inner mind might we see our Lord Jesus and might we understand his suffering and might we understand why it is that his disciples could sleep when he was sweating and in anguish. We pray that you would be with us tonight in your name. Amen. I'd like you to come with me in your mind's eye to a garden on a hillside just outside of Jerusalem. It's dark, it's humid, and the disciples and the Lord Jesus have just taken communion together, the first communion service together. Judas has disappeared into the darkness, and Jesus goes up to the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane, and there he begins to pray. If you have your Bibles, please open them to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. If you're not familiar with using your Bible, Matthew's about in the middle. And then it's on the uh, verse 26. Now I know some of you are laughing, but maybe we have some visitors that haven't used their Bibles. Let's help them out. I hope there are. I've been praying there are some visitors here who haven't opened a Bible in a long time. And so let us come to Matthew chapter 26. We'll begin in verse 36. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples, and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So you could not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again he came and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them, he went away and he prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and he said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. So that we might understand the anguish of our Lord Jesus a little better, flip over to Luke. And in Luke chapter 2, verse 22, verse 41, chapter 22, verse 41. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw away and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And he being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood, falling to the ground. So you're in the garden with me now. It's hot and it's humid. The disciples are asleep. And a man by himself is praying in agony. Why is it that Jesus can pray so earnestly 
and his disciples are able to sleep? Why is it that their spirit is willing, but their flesh is weak? In the two texts that I've read, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is very much a son of Adam. He's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The divine Son of God was made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. And so our Lord Jesus tonight is a man. And as a man, he is in anguish in the garden and he is awake, but his disciples are asleep. And so there's a great difference between Jesus Christ and his disciples the disciples Peter and James and John came into this little enclosed garden space with Jesus and they fell asleep from exhaustion and sorrow and instead of watching and praying, they slept. But Jesus prays earnestly. Hear again his words. My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And again, for a second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he went and prayed for a third time, saying the words again, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. Now, our Lord Jesus is a brave man. He's brave in the proclamation of the gospel. He's strong in his condemnation against sin when he's speaking to power. He has argued with the theologians and the lawyers of Israel, and he has done so without fear. His disciples are brave as well. They have fought with demons and cast them out, and they have raised the dead, and they have Proclaim the gospel throughout all of Israel. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We know that these men are brave men. When Judas comes with the soldiers in a few moments, Peter draws out his sword and he's prepared to defend Jesus with his life. So they are brave men and yet they sleep in the garden. And Jesus prays out and cries out to God in agony, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. In a few moments, Brother Fleck is going to talk to us a little bit about the crucifixion. Uh, a crucifixion is a gruesome and horrifying way to die. And yet it was the death of tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people under the Romans and throughout history. Now, many of the people who died were afraid, but many of the people who died on the cross were very brave. And shall we say that some of those who went the way of the cross and did not break down are better men than Jesus? God forbid, no. Jesus was and is the bravest man that ever lived, and yet he's sweating drops of blood. And he's saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And so the issue cannot be that our Lord Jesus is frightened of the physical suffering that will occur on the cross. The, the man who bested Satan in single combat after 40 days without eating or drinking in the wilderness is not frightened to face the death on the cross in a physical sense. The pain of the cross is great, but it is within the human capacity to bear. And so we must dig deeper. We, we have to think more about our Bibles. We, we've got to come under and understand. And let me tell you one of the fascinating things in the Scriptures, in the Gospels, do you know who the first creatures are who identify Jesus Christ after, his, after he begins his preaching ministry, who they are that first identifies him as the Holy One of God and the Son of God? Do you know who it is? It's the demons. It's the fallen angels who recognize Jesus as the Holy One of God and call out to him, O Son of God. Now how is it that the demons can know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? They know that he is the Son of God because it was the Son of God who created the demons. They know that Jesus is the Son of God because it was Jesus Christ who stood up to the prince of demons in the guise of the serpent and said, Someday I will come as the seed of Eve and crush your head. 
And so the demons know who Jesus is. And so when the Son of God became a man, the angels said, Glory to God on the highest and and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. But the demons shuddered. And the reason that the demons shuddered is that doom was on the way because Jesus Christ, the God-man, was on the march. And they know that Jesus is coming. Now these are great and mysterious truths about the Son of God, but there's a terribleness to this truth that we must contemplate to this night. And what this means is that the Son of God, our Lord Jesus, when he prophesies of the future words to those who hate him, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and the angels. It meant that the Son of God in his divine nature had seen hell. He knows the geography and the climate of hell. He knows what a darkness full of fire is like. He knows what a worm that consumes but never dies is. Because he as the Son of God had prepared the eternal fire for the demons. But you see, the worst possible torment of hell is not the darkness and it is not the fire and it is not the worms, but it is rather that God is not present in his mercy, but only present in his wrath. Now, please understand, there is a real fire and there are real worms, but these things are merely descriptive of what it is like to experience the wrath of God poured out upon sin. The punishment for sin is to be removed from the presence of God. So Psalm 5 tells us of our God, For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. And so the punishment for sin then is to be driven away from the glorious presence of God to the place where there is only the wrath of God. Sin is like night, and it retreats from the dawning sun. And sin cannot stand in the glorious presence of God, and those who practice sin must suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. And so why is it that Jesus is in anguish in the garden? Jesus, our Lord, is without sin, Jesus of Nazareth enjoyed sweet communion with God the Father from his birth. He walked with the Spirit of God. Do you know there are three times that God the Father speaks over Jesus Christ in the New Testament? And in two of those times, do you know what he says? This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And so Jesus walked in communion with the Father. To have God the Father speak over you as a river of delights and pleasures forevermore. And to have God call you his beloved son with whom I am well pleased is glory. Jesus tasted the perfect glory of friendship and communion with God the Father through the Spirit. And there is no greater glory and delight than to enjoy and rejoice in the love of God the Father. God the Father is well pleased with his Son, and yet his Son is in anguish in the garden. And it is to here that we come to why Jesus prayed, My Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. You see, the cup that Jesus will drink from is not merely the cup of the cross, but rather he will drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And our Lord Jesus Christ is going to take that gruesome cup and he's going to tip it to his lips and he is going to drink all of it until there is nothing left and the cup is dry. Now the Lord Jesus was under no compulsion to die because of sin, because he had not sinned. Jesus could have been translated straight to heaven and been ushered into the throne room of God as the great victor over the evil one and the beloved Son of God. Yet instead of embracing that joy in the throne room, we find him tormented in prayer in the garden. The thing that drove him to the cross was his love for the Father and the Father's love for the world. 
Our Lord Jesus so loved the Father, and because the Father loved the world, Jesus was to drink the wine of God's wrath so that the world might be saved. The thing that you and I deserve for our least sin against the magnificent and holy God is an eternity in the fire. God's holiness is so great that the least deviation from his law is eternal death. The the least smirk at a pretty face. The the least little tidbit of gossip that you've buried into your heart to share at the appropriate moment. These things are worthy of death and hell. Our Lord Jesus must go to the cross and drink the bitter cup that we deserve for our sin. The Apostle Paul describes it this way, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. And so the Son of God, born in Bethlehem, must drink the wrath of God for sin, as if he himself were not only a sinner, but he must also take on himself all of the sins. He is sin in total and complete. For our sake God the Father made Jesus Christ to be sin who knew no sin. And so the perfect Lamb of God, innocent of all things, must go to the cross and have God the Father turn His back on Him. God the Father must withdraw His glorious presence from the Son of God so that He might suffer the punishment of eternal destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. And this is the thing that makes Jesus sorrowful in the garden, not the death on the cross. The death on the cross was only a picture of what was happening to our Lord Jesus Christ. The thing that makes him sweat is that Jesus can imagine hell, and it is the worst possible thing. You see, the apostles can sleep because they lack imagination. They are sad. They know that Jesus is upset, but they're not focused on pleasing God the Father and all this suffering that awaits Jesus, and so they can take a nap. Think on this with me. When we enjoy our sin, when when we take that little morsel of gossip and we let it melt on our tongue like a chocolate, and we consume it and we hold it, when we grasp a little glory for ourselves as we pass the mirror, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, do you see what God made there? That's me. Praise God for that, huh? When we grasp that glory, when we take it away from God, we're pushing ourselves away from God. And the more that we enjoy our sin, the further we push ourselves away from God because that is what sin is. Sin is separating ourselves from all that is good and wholesome in this world and running towards the one place where God's mercy does not dwell. And that is hell, the lake of fire. If you're here tonight and you ever suffer in hell, please understand that God gave you what you wanted when you sinned. Because when you sinned, the thing that you wanted was to enjoy sin without God's presence. And God gives that to you in the end. The one thing that Jesus wants is to glorify God the Father. He wanted to rejoice in the glory that he had with the Father before the foundation of the earth. He wanted to bask in the golden showers of the Father's love. And yet Jesus loves God the Father and sinners so much that he's willing to go to the cross. Jesus who hated sin, Jesus who hated the idea of rebellion and death was going to die and become the sum total of sin for us even though he was innocent. And so Jesus in the garden is imagining the coming torment. He's imagining the geography of suffering. As the divine Son of God, he knows what it looks like to be abandoned by God and to be away from the glory of his presence. And in his human nature, he wonders, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. My Father, is there another way? But what does God the Father say through the sad events of that night with his disciples sleeping? What does God the Father say in the tramp of the soldiers' feet as they approach with Judas? 
He says, my beloved son, it is necessary. You must die. You must be lifted up so that I might draw all men to myself. You must drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength in the cup of his anger because I have so loved the world that I gave my only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. You are the price. And because Jesus loved the Father and because Jesus loved his people, he stood up from his prayers. He woke up the disciples and he said with a strength and a dignity that only comes through prayer and the Spirit of God, rise up, let us be going, see my betrayer is at hand. And Jesus marched towards the cross for the joy that was set before him, despising the shame. And beloved Christian friends, we are his joy. He died so that we might live. He died so that we can come together here tonight and worship him. And that God the Father might look down and he doesn't see our sins, but he sees the righteousness of his son. He died so that the Holy Spirit might come and change our hearts. He died so that we might believe and we are his joy. Now what should we do with these things? Trembling Christian, I have challenged you tonight to think about hell. And if you are here tonight and you are trembling, understand that your sins are forgiven in Christ. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have saved you, and you are their beloved. Hell is not your final home. And I spoke of God the Father speaking over his Son, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Hear the words that God will speak over his children. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Master. Because Jesus Christ drank up the wine of the cup of God's wrath, there is nothing left for us in heaven but joy of God. And so we can come before God in great confidence. Now friends, the disciples were saved. And yet they were sleeping in the garden. I wonder tonight if I have a Christian here who's slumbering in the garden of the church. You're not watching and praying so that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. A slumbering Christian, it's comfortable in that pew. It's a humid night tonight. You're comfortable in your small sins, so you sleep. Hear the words of the Apostle Paul. Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. O sleeping Christian, watch and pray. Watch and pray, because these are evil days. Does anyone believe these are good days? These are evil days, and we need to be watching and praying. And if you're not watching and praying and you're a Christian, you are not imagining hell, and you do not understand what Christ suffered for us on the cross. Now, my non-Christian friends, and I hope, I pray that there are non-Christians here tonight. Everybody's looking down. I hope that means that you're all Christians. But if there's a non-Christian here tonight, do you understand why it is that you enjoy your sin? You enjoy your sin because you cannot imagine hell. You enjoy your sin because you cannot imagine your latter end. You enjoy enjoy sex outside of marriage. You enjoy getting drunk and getting high. You rejoice in lying and stealing and gossiping and pride and all of these other sins, both great and small, because you cannot imagine hell. 
If you knew what suffering awaits for you in hell, you would jerk those earbuds with those filthy lyrics right out of your ears. You would never touch that woman again. You wouldn't touch that man again. You'd drop the needle like it was fire because it is. But you must understand it's not necessary for you to go there. It's not necessary for you to experience what Jesus Christ is imagining because he went to the cross and he became sin so that sinners might believe. And so little sinners and great sinners and dirty sinners and sinners like pastors from Andover Baptist Church, hear me. The bravest man in the world trembled at what awaits you and you can avoid it if you will repent of your sins and trust in him because he died so that sinners might be saved. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, make us imagine hell. Make us see it. Make us smell it. Oh God, might we smell it so that we would hate it and we would flee to you and your Father. And we pray these things through your Spirit. Amen.